Now that we have a good understanding of the fundamental physics underlying proton NMR, we can start applying this method. Going, for example, from a molecular structure to an educated guess of the shape of the NMR spectrum of this compound, and more interesting in my humble opinion, going from a proton NMR spectrum that, for example, we've measured to an educated guess of the molecular structure of the compound. And unlike infrared and mass spec, we can get very detailed information about connectivity from a proton NMR spectrum alone in many cases. So here, we're given the structure of isopropyl acetate and asked to predict the NMR spectrum. And I think the easiest way to go about this is, first of all, identify the numbers and types of signals and their integrations, thinking about chemical equivalence of the different types of protons. Then we're going to dig into multiplicity and coupling, thinking about the splitting pattern associated with each signal. So we know the number of signals from stage one. We're going to get the splitting patterns of each signal in stage two. And then in stage three, we're going to think about chemical shifts. And this is really where having a correlation chart in, in hand is going to come in handy. You can look, for example, at the molecular structure, recognize a particular functional group or a particular structural pattern like, oh, this carbon is alpha 2 or adjacent to an oxygen atom, and go to your correlation chart and figure out where that should be, where that signal should be for this proton in a chemical shift sense. The, really, the first two steps are the most important here since we're just going to use a correlation chart for the third, so I'll spend very little time on the chemical shifts. Very first thing we need to do is lay down the implied hydrogens, and I've gone ahead and done that here. We've got three methyl groups and the isopropyl methine hydrogen right here. The three hydrogens here are chemically equivalent to each other, and the six hydrogens in the methyl groups of the isopropyl fragment are equivalent to each other. And finally, the methine proton is all by its lonesome right here in the third distinct set of protons, if you like. So we should expect three signals in the NMR spectrum of this compound, one due to this methyl, one due to the two methyls of the isopropyl group, and one due to the methine hydrogen. Okay, what about splitting patterns? Well, let's start with this methyl group. Look at the carbons next door, or the atoms next door, the atoms connected to the carbon. This carbon is connected to this methyl carbon, and there are no hydrogens at this carbonyl carbon. So these three hydrogens have no geminal or vicinal neighbors. Therefore, we will see a singlet for this signal. And it's adjacent to a carbonyl group, which is going to shift it downfield slightly or de-shield the hydrogen slightly relative to a plain vanilla alkyl uh, set of protons or, or alkyl protons. So about 2 ppm is to be expected here. And this, again, you could get from a correlation chart for proton NMR. All right, let's move on to these two CH3s. These two CH3s are both connected to this common carbon. And at that carbon, we have one neighboring proton, one vicinal proton. So those, the signal for those six hydrogens will be split into a doublet by this one neighboring proton. There, these are more or less plain vanilla alkyl protons, a bit of an inductive effect due to the nearby oxygen. About 1.5 ppm is to be expected there. And then finally, for the methine proton, well, it's connected to this carbon, and that carbon has two neighbors with six total vicinal hydrogens to the methine hydrogen. And so there we would expect a septet due to the six neighboring hydrogens. And that's alpha to an oxygen. And so that hydrogen is going to feel a strong inductive effect from the oxygen atom. It's going to feel the electronegativity of that oxygen. And the chemical shift there comes out to something like four and a half ppm. That's actually going to be the most de-shielded signal in this spectrum. So having laid down all that information, now we can roughly draw the spectrum. For example, that septet is going to show up right about here, 4.7 ppm. It's going to integrate to one hydrogen. The integrations follow from the number of hydrogens in each set that we determined way back in stage one. The red signal here is the singlet due to the methyl group over here, around 2 ppm. That's going to integrate to 3. And the doublet due to the isopropyl CH3 groups is going to integrate to 6. And again, it's a doublet due to the splitting of the methine proton. Here we have the same idea with a more complicated looking compound. But as we'll see, we're going to do a little trick here to simplify this problem a great deal. We're tasked to draw the expected proton NMR spectrum of the compound, and we're going to follow the same process we did over here, thinking about the numbers and types of signals and their integrations first, then splitting patterns, and then finally chemical shifts, which I'm going to spend very little time on, again, because that can be inferred from a proton NMR correlation chart quite easily. 
All right, let's start by adding in the implied hydrogens. And I'm actually only going to do so on one side of the molecule for reasons that will become apparent here in a second. And you may have already noticed the reason why. Now, how many of these are chemically equivalent? How many distinct sets of hydrogens do we have? How many signals would we expect? Well, the aldehyde proton on the far left is way out on its own. So that's one signal. These two CH3s are both connected to a common carbon, and they are enantiotopic in fact. And so they are chemically equivalent and will show up at the same chemical shift in the same signal. Ditto for the next two CH2s. These are chemically equivalent to each other and these are chemically equivalent to each other. So there's two more sets, total of four sets so far. And then finally that CH2 wedged between this oxygen and the carbonyl group is another unique set of hydrogen. So we have this set right here. Now you may be inclined to continue walking along, right? And just adding the CH2 here and evaluating chemical equivalence there. That's one way to go about this. Another way to go about this is to notice that this is a symmetric molecule. Notice got an aldehyde here, aldehyde there, two methyl groups there, two methyl groups there, and so on and so forth. This molecule has a rotational axis of symmetry that is aligned with that central carbonyl group. This means that, for example, these hydrogens are homotopic with respect to the purple hydrogens we previously identified. Those will all show up in one signal. So now what I can do is essentially copy over all of these protons to the other half of the molecule, in essence, doubling the size of each set, right? I've gone from two purple protons to four. I've gone from six orange protons to 12, so on and so forth. This will affect the integrations, right? And ultimately how many hydrogens are associated with each signal. Now let's talk about splitting patterns. And let's start with the aldehyde. So the aldehyde typically does not couple with neighbors, but even if it did, there are no neighbors for the aldehyde proton. This carbon is quaternary, has no hydrogens attached. So that would ex be expected to be a singlet. Likewise, with the 12 CH3 protons, the neighboring carbon is quaternary, no coupling there. And that's gonna be way upfield due to pretty much the basic alkyl-like nature of those CH3 protons. The green methine, that is adjacent to an one neighboring set of two blue protons here. And so we can apply the N plus one rule actually. We have just one neighboring set of protons. We'd expect that to be a triplet and integrate to four. And likewise with the blue protons, we would expect this also to be a triplet that integrates to four. Four, because we have four protons total in this set. And in terms of chemical shift, this is actually a good opportunity to pause and test your knowledge of chemical shift. Do you think these protons are shielded or deshielded with respect to these? If you said deshielded, you are correct. These will appear downfield of the green protons due to this adjacent oxygen here. Still a triplet though, still a triplet that integrates to four. Finally, have, we have one more peak or signal rather, that integrates to four, and that's gonna be this purple signal. This will be a singlet, however, because those hydrogens have no neighbors, no neighboring hydrogens. I have an oxygen here, carbon here, neither of which is linked to a hydrogen. So we would expect the purple signal to be a singlet that integrates to four. Again, pretty far downfield, right? Pretty deshielded protons there, feeling the heat not only from this electronegative oxygen, but also from the adjacent carbonyl group. Here we're interested in recognizing ways we can use proton NMR to distinguish between distinct compounds. We're asked to explain how we would use proton NMR spectroscopy to tell the difference between each of these pairs. In A, we have similar functional groups in both molecules, and this is a testament to the power of NMR, that it's able to distinguish easily between these two compounds just based on their difference in connectivity. The difference here is really in these CH2 groups. They're next to each other in this first compound, but they're sort of separated by the carbonyl group in the second one. Furthermore, the second compound has a kind of symmetry, reflectional symmetry, for example, or rotational symmetry that the first compound does not have with that carbonyl group kind of out of whack, 
right? And this suggests that we can use differences in the multiplicity and number of CH2 signals observed in the proton NMR spectrum to tell the difference. And let's dig in and see how this would actually work. In the first compound, I've got two sets of CH2s that are not chemically equivalent to each other. These blue CH2s have different connectivity, right? They're closer to the benzene ring, for example, than the red CH2 protons. And those would couple with each other, so we would expect two triplets in the NMR spectrum of this compound on the left. In the right-hand compound, we have symmetry. So in fact, all four CH2 protons are chemically equivalent to each other. The two CH2 groups, we could say, are homotopic with respect to each other. So here we would observe a singlet, one singlet in the NMR spectrum, no neighboring protons to either of these, right? I've got a carbon with a CO double bond and two single bonds to other carbons there, and I've got no protons here, no protons here. So we would expect one singlet to appear in the NMR spectrum of this compound on the right. So big difference in the multiplicity and number of CH2 signals in these two compounds. In B, the only difference, again, is one of connectivity. We've got the same functional groups, they're just arranged in a somewhat different way. And here again, we've got a difference in symmetry. We've got, for example, a plane of symmetry or an axis of rotational symmetry right there in this compound. We don't have that same plane of symmetry, vertical or perpendicular to the screen plane of symmetry in this structure on the left. So we would expect a difference in the number of arene CH signals. And we can use this potentially to distinguish between these two compounds. Their coupling properties would also be different, but we're not going to dig into that here. It's actually a good opportunity to practice your understanding of coupling to think about how the splitting patterns of these signals would be different. So in B, we have, in fact, four distinct arene CH protons, red, orange, blue, and purple, as I've labeled them here. And this is a good opportunity, again, to check your understanding of chemical equivalence. Make sure you can convince yourself that these four protons are not the same. They're chemically inequivalent. They all have different connectivity. But in the molecule on the right, we've got symmetrically disposed protons, arene CH groups that are related by this axis of rotation or reflection plane right there. And so here, we've got two protons here, and two protons here, each of which are chemically equivalent to each other. These are equivalent, and these are equivalent. So while in the first case, we would expect four signals in the aromatic CH range, 6.5 to 8 ppm, we'd expect only two signals in the NMR spectrum of this compound in that arene CH range, again, between 6.5 and 8 ppm. So the difference in number of signals is an easy tell for one of these compounds over the other.